Hey guys, let's do it. So here's the list of things we're doing today. We're going to get going. We're going to do lights and sound and a little bit of interactivity. Uh, I'm screen recording. And um, we're going to get going with lights. Um, so I've made a cave where there's very little light. <coughs> and we're just going to quickly talk about, we're going to go through these fairly quickly because you've been doing a little bit of lights. But over here on the left side, we have um, the four main lights of, um, of Unreal. You've seen the directional light. That's been your sun. That's the one we've started off with the most. Uh, directional light, it does not matter the position of it. It is the rotation that changes the way the light works. So we can come out to the one that's already in the scene. And we can see that as we rotate it, it'll change. Uh, yes. So we see that rotation changes the way the light works. Um, but if I make a, if I move the position, it don't matter none at all. And then the exact inverse is a point light. That when I bring in a point light, we'll go in on it by double clicking here we can see that position, there's two axes right there, position matters, and rotation does not. So we have another type that I don't know if you guys have gone through or not. Uh, we have a spotlight. A spotlight is a directional light that has an inner and an outer edge to it. I'm going to delete the point light. And I am going to come over to this little window I made over here. And I'm going to put a little spotlight there. It's super awesome. I know. But it's real clear. It's down there. Yep. So you see this has a cone. Just like a spotlight like you see on a stage and everything. And so we can do rotation and position on a spotlight. And we can make it come through this little hole here. And make a little cool lighting. And then that size of that cone, if we come over to the details panel, we can, well, let's just go through all of them because there, a lot of these are um, similar for all the other lights. We have an intensity. Uh, you might think that numbers like 10,000 are a lot to have, but that is actually quite reasonable for amount of light here. And you can actually overload it and go to numbers that are much higher than 10,000. That's just where it wants to stop you. Because um, maybe that's not a reasonable brightness, but for me, I think it's funny. Um, put it back. Uh, lights do have color, which we've definitely um, seen. We've changed those inside of um, blueprints before. I'm going to cancel that. Um, and now here's what I was talking about, the inner and outer cone. We can see that there is no inner cone. It's at zero. But we can bring it out. And then basically it says that... Every side, everything inside this inner cone is the same intensity, and at the edge of it, start falling off. So start a gradient of getting less bright. And let's make it a little bit longer, which is not the source line. So the, the attenuation is how long it reaches. So now you can see it's hitting all the floor all the way through. And maybe now we can see that inner and outer cone when we build the lighting a little better. Yeah, the barn doors kind of thing yeah. effect. So now you can see we. Uh, so that's another thing is we never actually have talked about building lighting. Lighting, you guys just kind of figured out on your own. Uh, you can build lighting only to see how all these things are affecting the lights are affecting your scene. What does it it's basically doing ray, ray tracing. It's bouncing everything off of everything. And we're going to talk about how to optimize that situation in a second, actually, because there's um, different kinds of uh, lights, um, of different kind of modes of lighting or, or mobility of lighting within. So let me find that guy again. Here he is. He's happy. So just to review, we had the inner cone, which we could change. Outer cone is where outside of this cone, it will not affect anymore. I can bring it in. We can have it send all its millions of little swarms of things out, bounce over everywhere, and you'll see the bottom right will build lighting, and this is where it's like great to have an amazing computer. And um, 
And then we can show how the um, attenuation radius is how long it goes. So we can bring it back and it wouldn't hit this back wall. Um, and that's really all we're going to do for right now. Uh, we definitely uh, look at effects world, um, and then uh, which means it's actually working right now. And um, cast shadows. We can actually make it not cast shadows if it was um, we want it just as a light source and maybe not as important for this as like a point light somewhere. Um, we would we would actually turn it off maybe if we didn't want to have any hard edges of the, and we want to have a, a smooth surface for a wall or something. The uh, I think the indirect lighting intensity. It's like if you look at it. Let me we'll look at this right now. Let's see. Oh, or just how it's going to bounce off everything. Let's build it again. Alright, and the other options. So you'll see right here mobility. Um, we have three different kinds for, for lights. We have static, stationary, and movable. And you'll see these little tool tips will tell you um, that like for instance uh, the static. So the static light can never move, it can never turn on and off, it can never change color. Um, it's completely baked into that scene and um, it renders very, very quickly. You want to use as much static light as you possibly can for the fastest running scene. You can still get great shadows from them, They're just not, those shadows aren't going to move. So I'm going to put a little point light here. Yeah, let's see if we get some better line shadows. There we go, there's some shadows. So we're going to make a static and we're going to bake it. Bake in a cake. So there's the shadows. You see this nice little undercarriage there. And ideally, if I move this, those shadows are still there. Which they still are, just they're not as dramatic as I could have made them. So those are baked in. Um, now obviously you wouldn't want shadows to stay if you're going to have a light that's going to move in your scene or if you're going to have it change intensity in your scene. So the little tool tip here for stationary is that we can actually have dynamic shadows and we can uh, change intensity. So basically it can't move still. This is the intermediary. If you just need to change intensity, have some light flickering and that kind of stuff, then you have to move over to, to stationary. And we'll see that if I go over here and build again, and then if I change the intensity, you'll see that the shadows will, will change with me. The intensity. Actually, this is a little bit hard to me. What are we supposed to do? It can. Oh, it's about bounce light. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, you would like, um, you could do it a lot of different ways. And maybe we'll get into that a little bit today um, with a lighting function, which is kind of like a material for your light bulb. Um, it's one we haven't gone over yet. So, and then we have the other one, which is a uh, movable. So this one, it can do everything you want to do with, with uh, dynamic shadows. And um, it, it takes long, much, much longer to build. And it also just doesn't look as nice. Um, but sometimes you just have to do that. And this is actually, this lighting is what's almost the most compelling part of these video game engines when you're building with light and you're building with shadows and you're creating illusion, you're moving times of day. This is what we use a lot of to make interactivity. But you'll see if you break apart very complex game worlds, they use these as very intense lights that are in there. They're, they're key light, but then they'll keep a little bit of crannies with the other lights to make sure that those are well lit and rendering quickly. It's... it's um, It's all about the idea of, like, if you break down a world, 
you're going to have these little tiny guys everywhere inside of them. Because in a video game, you can explore every single part of the world. Therefore, you don't want to have a place unless it's part of the narrative that can't be seen. So you use a lot of lights in video games. How do you want to, um, if you don't want to have shadows at all, you can t go to the light source and you see one that says uh, at the bottom of the first little section, it says cast shadows. I could take that off. So I could take all these lights and then we're not dealing with any shadows and it's a much more speedy process. Or we can say it doesn't affect the world and then now they're not affecting the world and they're doing nothing. Maybe you just want to have it in there as a place filler. So that's just kind of the, like the mind state to have when you're trying to choose what kind of light you're, you're using. It's like severe loss of performance. That was good. Everyone's laptops are crashing. Um, okay, so we also didn't really talk about, but I know a lot of you guys figured out that there's a thing called a light mass importance volume. And, you know, it's probably, it was pretty important um, for rendering, but I didn't want to mention it because it just sounds like an obtuse kind of phrase. Over here in your volumes, or you just search for it, you have a light mass important volume. And so when it does that building of lighting, it looks everywhere in this world, and you can have giant levels. But if you're only going to be in this cave, you need to give it an area that it needs to focus on. And that's all this is. And by default, it's a square, but you can kind of change the shapes of these. I might already have one. So if this game is only taking place in this cave, then we don't need to see four miles off into the other world. But if you're baking lighting without a light mass importance volume, it'll do everything. When it does that swarming of bouncing everything off of every brick and every um, uh, static mesh inside your world, um, it could just take time and it can make your game very, very slow. And video games are real-time engines that the whole point is trying to optimize things by using just the amount, just a big enough texture so that it looks good close up, but no more than that because it takes too much um, processor um, speed to, to actually render it out. And leveraging lights, you know, Unreal has beautiful lights, but you only want the ones that you're going to be focusing on, the key lights, to be the ones that are actually like the beautiful ones. The other ones, you can kind of ignore them. I'm going to see if there is a volume in here. No, there's not. So... Um, we can put a light mass, it starts off pretty small, and then we just scale that up like any other asset. So maybe, maybe we're not going to go as tall, so just do wide first, and then do a little height. Move it up. And so now I'm only worrying about this world. And now I've optimized it. And you guys have already gone and kind of gotten into materials as light, so I'm not really going to talk about that as much. But we can definitely talk a little bit about uh, color theory. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a, um, a Debbie Cooler. It was much more um, popular application for them a, a while back. But it is a wonderful color scheme, finder, database, resource for finding um, different color palettes. And... You basically can get the RGB or hexadecimal or HSV, I'm sure, of different kind of light palettes. So you find a kind of a root color and you move it around and it kind of helps you find c contrasting things. I often will use like exactly five lights and I'll make them, I'll find out the colors that I want to use. And there's different little color rules, what is analogous, what are complementary, what are compound. And it could be a good way to start off with um, how you're going to actually dial in some of these values. 
Um, if you've watched any movie in the past 20 years, you've probably been inundated with um, the idea of the contrast of blue and orange um, in, in the movies. And it's kind of a, a joke, but people still do it because it kind of works. And the idea is, let's get rid of some of these lights. I mean, I, I know you wouldn't, but, you know, other people that we won't name will probably do still. You know, we won't call them out right now. And I will right now, too. So, uh, so we're just going to static mesh, and we're going to use this beautiful... This is our stand-in model right here. It's cheap as labor I could find. And we're just going to take a look at the idea of having two contrasting colored lights just so we're being mindful of what we're doing. We're not just be, we're not, not just doing work lighting. We're actually lighting for things. If I was in this room, let's say I turn off this, this point light, but I, I still want to see what I'm doing. These aren't work lights. These are actual aesthetic things. If you want to see what this world looks like if it's too dark, there's different modes of viewing. And you could say, I want to see what this looks like unlit. And I can actually navigate my world. There's no need to waste your time putting in lights just to see what you're working on. And there's a lot of different modes here. You can go through, we can look at things wireframe. Look at lighting only. There's a bunch of these. I love world normals. Um, but that's kind of getting sidetracked. But all, looking at awesome things. So we have one light and we're going to make it blue. We're going to turn it back on. And then we're going to have another one. And that's going to be the orange one. Orange is down there. We're going to kind of come down here to see that if we, let's go on top of it so I can bring it closer. You can see how it kind of the contrast of these things, they don't have to be actual different colors, it's easier to see it this way, it makes the object pop a little bit. You see how it brings it out from the background? This is getting into the idea of three-point lighting, which is like the kind of standard interview lighting you do if you're making a documentary, where you would use side lighting so you can emphasize one side over the other, front lighting so that you can see the face, and then a backlighting so that you separate the head from the background. And obviously we're not doing documentaries, but you, do, you will have maybe some characters that are non-playing characters that you might want to light better so that they really stand apart from this world you're building. And you might even think about like, oh, I want to designate like a few lights to each of them, not just one that's like a work light, but actually aesthetically light them so that they have balance. And it helps them fit, fit, fit into the world and you're using a 3D game engine. This helps add layers of depth. And it's a spotlight. Oh, it's probably because it's like in the middle of some rocks. That's why. That's why I always say it's all about collisions. That's colliding things. All right. So the idea that these are all lights are great, and I, I'm sure you guys understand that um, these lights cannot be moved if uh, moved around if they're not movable. And I do this all the time. I want to send a light across. I want to rotate a, a light so it's a day-night cycle and it won't move. And you have to be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's because it's not movable. Your code works fine. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, you mean the, this right here, the view mode? No, no, no. Okay. Oh, yeah, and the light attribute. Yeah. Now you're I can move it now because I'm not rendering in real time. This is just a, the, the like, when you're, when you're playing, exactly. For right now, it's, yeah, I don't have to, it's, everything is always slidable and malleable inside this world. I thought you were talking about these, like, view modes. You can actually switch between these when you're playing. It's kind of awesome. There's that.
This is crappy video game BJ. So, yeah, so let's see if we have light maps, light map resolution. So down here, there's a little, little drop down. You have some other options. Uh, for instance, a lighting uh, follows what's called an inverse square law. It kind of does a logarithmic fall off where um, it, it doesn't go linearly falling off. Uh, this kind of stuff can actually seem like it's going to make it a little bit too bright, but it's really cool for coloring things with lights. If you don't want any shadows at all, and you take off this inverse square law, and you dial them down considerably. Even more than that. Let's do like 10. You can see they're just really nice colors on the there's on the on these rocks. They're not really falling off. They just kind of blend into each other. And just the angles of which they hit the rocks are kind of overlapping. It creates this nice little texture. So I told you about um, a light function material. So I don't think there's probably any in here to start off with. Uh, those are just materials, materials. Uh, let's make a light mass function material real quick. So I'm going to get static meshes and go into my contents, into my assets, and I'm just going to make a material here in my material folder. Light function 01. So a light function, as you'd probably guess, once we once we open up, is only going to really talk about the emissive properties. So right here we have material um, domain. We're going to now switch to a light function. And yes, indeed, it is just an emissive color. So I can do a 3vec right here. Right, We have a color that is a certain RG to B. And this would be a very un uninteresting material to put in there. But we also have elements of, of time and, and also we have mathematical functions. So I forget how this works, so I'm going to just take a second to... Okay, so... I'm saying this quietly because I actually forgot. And if it works, I'll be like out loud and saying it very proudly. Look what I did. There we go. So now we have like um, nothing because I'm going to start from scratch like I promised. So we have three vectors. We have R, G, and a B. And we want to change it over time. So we do have a thing called time in our materials. And it's kind of in a little input data that is built into the engine. And it just kind of counts forward. Then we can do some math. We, we've talked about sign before when we were dealing with some textures. And we can kind of preview this node here. And we can see that at this point, I just said preview this node by right-clicking. And it's actually bypassing going all the way here. And it's just going straight into there. And you can see what it looks like without having to build everything all together. I can see where this little chain link works at any point along, along the, the, the uh, chain. So I can take that off. And I'm going to take the sign. And I'm kind of, frac is basically like a... It's just a fraction, um, but it's actually kind of a random fraction, and it's great for using Flickr. Um, not the Yahoo service, but the. 
the one of the colors, a three vec, you have a one variable, two variables, and three variables by pressing the one, two, and three button and clicking your space. You can make the three variable by taking a two and also just pending it to a three. And this is the same thing as a three variable. They're called constants here because they're not scalar parameters. Move it in here, we go to the abyss of color, and now we have this kind of flickering light. And so without having to worry about like curves or whatever, we have this random um, material. I'm gonna go ahead and save. Go out of here, and then I want the white light, the front light, to have that material function. And we have a light function material. So there's my little flickering light. It's not moving, it's just doing a material change. And this is great for like a torch, right? Like something against the wall, and you can just use these over and over again. Make instances of them for different colors. And now we've got a little dynamic stuff going on. In, in here? Yeah, but it only it's only affected so because of this is in a domain uh, domain now. This is like it only knows the uh, emissive stuff, even though it wasn't. It's basically saying bypass everything else, go from here exactly to kind of like what 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 would go what would happen with this, and and um, it's just this one is kind of like this is not really that emissive. Um, but yeah, you're, you're talking about when I said start previewing node. Yeah, like can I do that without it? Yes, it would. Yeah, exactly. And this is, you know, just we'll, we'll, we could play around with that um, a little bit at home. So I think that's it for lights, but that got you a pretty good. There's a thing called IES texture, and this is basically like simulating real lighting cones and real lighting, like theatrical lighting. There's a free package of like 90 of these on the marketplace. If you're interested in actually doing a stage and really simulating theater lighting, check out those. There, I'm not a lighting expert when it comes to actually theatrical stuff, but it's actually simulating real, actual lights, and it has the names that you would know if you worked in lighting on, on stage. So we're gonna quickly go over to sound. So, um, in on, uh, Unreal, it has a, um, a few sound properties, but for video games in general, the go-to is actually doing your stuff in a program called FMOD. Uh, I'm not going to show demo FMOD, but I'm going to show you what to do with FMOD. FMOD is for both Unity and for Unreal, and if you definitely want, if you want to do multi-channel sound, this is kind of the way to go for it. Uh, Unreal doesn't really have that many great sound exporting features. It kind of just whatever you're plugged into, it just goes out of it and it gives it like directional sound as you navigate around. But if you really want to do like 5.1, 7.1 sound, then uh, FMOD's the, the, the industry standard. Go ahead. I mean, if you want to do a karaoke installation, then that's fine. Yeah. Well, I, I would love it if, if we made everything, you know, but it really depends. Like, if you need, like, orchestral music, I'm not going to make you go rent a symphonic orchestra to go get that sound. Uh, so maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, we'll deal with it. Let me know before you put, you know, Baby Got Back in your, uh, you know. So for now, as long as you are covered on this, under the shield of the student work, you're good. But if your piece gets, you know, you get, you get famous and it gets out on the internet, there's probably going to come after you, especially if it gets... If you're it surrounded gets, by artists, you leverage your friends, you know? But you're still a student, so you're good. Make, make them famous too. Uh, so FMOD has two different components. It has a standalone editor, and then if you go down to Unreal, you'll see also there's Unity. You also can get 
fmod for Windows, Mac, and Linux. You have lots of free login, free register, and you download the uh, plugin. Uh, the plugin goes into the actual in engine installation for the version you have. So if you're using 4.9, we would go into like for Mac and Windows. You figured out some program files. We have Epic Games. I have too many things installed. These are Epic Games. Uh, that's the launcher. Well, I know where it is on Windows because I did this on a Windows computer earlier, but essentially wherever your, your game is installed, there's a place for plugins. You put this plugin there, and then it has right here a link to tutorials on YouTube, and you get to listen to this wonderful Australian lady Ryan, who ends every sentence like this, and, and if you listen to it really fast, it goes, whoop, 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 uh, whoop. I did this today. It was really, really funny. But it has like uh, t t shows you how to do multi-channel sound with like this wonderful world with um, a tornado and all this kind of stuff. Um, this is a lot more modular stuff, but I'm going to show you how to do things inside of Unreal today um, because this is not my wheelhouse. It's uh, definitely for an audio class. If you're interested in this stuff, um, I'll learn it with you. Um, so, but what we are going to do is we're going to need some sounds. So there's a few resources I want to tell you guys about. And I'll put them in Slack as we go along. Week se is this week seven or eight? We'll say this is a week question mark. And I'll rename it later. I will only do that. Anyway. So inside this week, I'm going to put a link for freesound.org. And yes, indeed, it's free. The sounds are... Um, just like all the other free sites for 3D models, you know, your success may vary on here. I think this also require, requires a uh, sign up. And you can just search for things like, I don't know, creating an environment. We might want some wind. So I'm going to search for desert wind or dessert wind. And, um, and then we have, we can view it right here within the web interface. You can kind of, let's go to one that's louder. That is a can rolling in the wind. There's unlimited, or not unlimited, but there's more than you'll ever need. All right, so that's fun. Um, also, what's cool are sound effects. When your things go pop, your particle effects go pop, or somebody opens the door, you want to have like a good Foley sound effect. So this was just released last week. On SoundCloud, this is for um, a music video, a visual poem by a gentleman named Beeple, who does Cinema 4D um, VJ clips. It's a bunch of high resolution, high quality um, sound effects it's for this uh, video called uh, uh, Zero Day, which is like, we can show you right here, it's like a little bit of it. This is all pre rendered This is rendered out for some 4D. But you see this guy. Um, so you can download one gigabyte of this kind of stuff. And it all sounds really great. It mixes together very well. Um, which might be better to do than going to free sound where you have to really do a mastering se session with it. And uh, the last one was also released today, or not today, this week. And this one's called, this is like a university's database of recording since 1929. And that, yeah, maybe today's the theme is walrus. So um, I'm now in Mo Mozilla, uh, Firefox, sorry, and I'm just going to choose, does this guy talk to me? No? I don't know. Uh, so this, this is called the Macaulay Library at Cornell University. It's the largest and oldest collection of nature recordings. And the whole thing has just been uploaded and searchable. And it's archived online for free. But you can't download it. Unless you happen no, to have a thing like... Log number 16737. A 
unless you happen to have a little plugin on for, for Firefox where you can actually download anything that's in a media player. LNS catalog number one six seven three seven. So I actually hit play instead of instead of download. LNS catalog number one six seven three seven. You download. There we go. So now I'm downloading this file of this wonderful bird. Okay. There's like 800 ways of doing this, um, and I'm sure you could, you've done it all before. So I now have MP3 for my Unreal sound, but I cannot import MP3. I can only import a WAV file. No AIF. Only only what? No MP3s. Yeah, just WAV files. Um, at very uh, there's a lot of different um, resolutions you can do, but it has to be 16-bit. And I'll show you how to do this kind of stuff. Um, before we go there, I'm going to show you how to find a free sound editor. And if you guys know of a better one, let me know. Um, there is Audacity. Audacity is a free audio editor and um, uh, also does audio recordings. And I think it even does uh, multi-channel stuff. Um, I've been using Adobe Audition since it was Cool Edit Pro in 1995. So... It was acquired in 2001 by Adobe. And so this is what I use for editing audio. And I'm just going to show you what can be done. I'm not going to go through a uh, tutorial on Adobe Audition. Because you could probably download some great sound files from the start. So I take my MP3 and I drag it in. And now we can see what this looks like. LNS catalog number one. And you can actually see those notes, right? That's great. So I want to make this kind of loopable. So I'm just going to trim out what I don't want. And I hit play. This file is already, you see it has one track here at the top. This is a mono track. This is not stereo. What I'm going to tell you right now is that you want to deal, if you want to deal with three-dimensional sounds, sounds that live inside your world, you want to have everything as mono. Um, in this program, we have a button that says stereo to mono conversion. You can just delete one of the tracks, but you want to have mono because if you do have stereo and you import it, it will override um, your three-dimensional location and always be a stereo track. So just dealing with mono is definitely the way to go unless you do want it to be a soundtrack clip or what's called um, um, UI sound. Uh, then obviously do stereo. You can also import... Um, uh, 2.1, 5.1, 7.1 sound. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a naming convention you have to use to import those and make them be used correctly. And if you're interested in that, I can go over that with you. It's in the documentation for the engine. Um, I do notice that there's a lot of like noise in here. It's not the most beautiful thing. So what's great about this kind of stuff is that you can say, oh, look at all this crap down here I don't want. Oops, now I'm only selecting this. I believe that all the bass frequencies. There's a lot of fun stuff you can do. You can also take a noise footprint. Say reduction, capture noise, sure. And then this stuff's got has gotten pretty sophisticated by now. And now I preview. That's it now versus. I feel like a remix is about to happen. I, this is unintentional, I promise you. And this obviously takes a, uh, a more subtle hand than I'm, I'm doing right now. But you can do the opposite. You can look at just the noise and kind of hear all of the, the music that you might be getting rid of. So you can see I'm actually losing some of the actual frequencies that I actually kind of want. And I can actually do a little bit more with this if I wanted to. But hey, or you can just get good sound to start off with. So I'm going to take this track and I'm going to save as and in my downloads I'm going to now, and I know this is kind of small on the screen, um, I'm going to choose waveform, wave PCM. I've heard people say WAV before. Uh, don't. Um, so when I was talking about the sample rate, um, no, I think it's fine, whatever. Uh, there's a whole range of sample rate. With this default here, this 4410, this is the rate at which you're playing music. It's like frame rate is like 30 frames a second. For video, audio can be processed much, much quicker. Um, 
four four one zero zero is CD quality. Uh, four eight zero zero is DVD quality. Um, certain things like music has to be at these quality. But if you're doing a, the spoken word, if you're doing voice, you can actually leverage less CPU on your computer and go down to like twenty two. Um, it's the only matter. Usually, everything you're going to get is like by default. Your phones, your all your microphones record at a decent quality to be used. And then it says mono. I could convert it to a different one if I wanted to. I'm going to keep it at mono. And then the bits it has to be 16 bits. All right. So now the option to save it is going just to my downloads, and that's fine. So that concludes the audition portion of today's lesson. So let's bring it in. So I'm going to import. Ooh. No, you, you, every time you correct me, you're right. So. Yeah. You, I'm going to hire you, you realize. <laughs> All right, we're going to export it noise and all. The demo would have gotten very, very boring if we just listened to noise the whole time. And then just override. Yes, override. And, as we were, before I got interrupted. Yeah. So... Um, here is that WAV file. If I knew how to use a, a, a sound editor, I wouldn't really need to use this um, uh, details panel. But you can do other things, like I want to make sure that it's looping. I um, actually can flag it as a mature content so that um, later on it could be turned off uh, carte blanche from a menu if uh, people weren't uh, mature enough for my stuff. Uh, you, can bring in, uh, you can bring in subtitles. Um, you can allocate sound groups. Later on, we'll do effects. So you can, um, if you put a, a sound as a part of a group, then all those effects happen to all those um, items in that group all at once. And it's a way of doing um, batch uh, conversions of, uh, of effects. Um, I'm, I, all I changed mine was, too, is that it's looping. So we're going to have a crazy, like, hyperactive bird. And he's going to live in this space, in this cave. He's a cave bird. There he is. Man, he has quite the lung. So we talked about um, attenuation for uh, lights. Well, sound has attenuation as well. We can do a fall-off, but it has a fall-off very much like the uh, spotlight. It has an inner and an outer cone. That inner cone is the volume is level all within that cone. And the outer cone is where it ends. And you have the same kind of different fall-offs. You can have linear fall-offs, logarithmic fall-offs. And it's kind of, you just like kind of test it and see. And you're just going to walk in and out of these spaces and see how they work. So um, I'm going to go to my details panel on the right here with it selected. And I could say I want to override attenuation, which was none. And now you see that circle. But that's just the inner one. There's your outer one. It's much bigger. So let's bring them all in so we can just hang out and huddle in our cave. It's basically a Friday night for me. Yeah, anyway, but I got pretty lights. All right, so we'll bring that in. And then just when we get out of the cave, we won't be able to hear it anymore. And this attenuation, this is a sphere. You can have custom shapes, and you can rotate them and uh, resize them. So if you want it to be like this weird cone of attenuation, you have that. Or if you want it to be like, if you're, if you're going through like a tunnel, and then you want nothing else around it to be affected, that you could make it a cone, uh, sorry, a, a, a capsule shape or something. Just keep it with sphere because there's no point in messing around with it too much. And let's test out and see if this works. Seems pretty quiet. Oh, now I'm in that, I'm in that inner circle. And that's really loud. And I, um, so it definitely does with the volume, but it's not doing Doppler. Doppler's going to affect the add later. Yeah. And I'm sorry that I'm not plugged into the house sound uh, for the sound um, demo. Um, so yeah, it has the follow it has a radius of, of where it starts to fall off and the fall off distance for how far it'll reach. So there's this other thing that says uh, LPF, and people in uh, the sound world will know that means a low pass filter. 
and it does exactly what it sounds. It lets just the low information pass. So this is when you get behind a wall and it would be muffled. Or if you get way too far and things go boom, that's built into the sound properties of Unreal. It's the physics of sound, not only just the physics of all the other different um, uh, phenomena. So we could say, yes, attenuate with that. And there's also, I wonder if that's a different color. I don't see it, but let's try to get out of the zone and see what it does for us. Uh, there's already sound in here because it's because I've used a different world. Let's get rid of that sound too. Starter key that sound. Okay, great. Let's make the well, I guess it works. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's a thing that's there. Um, all the other stuff we're going to kind of do. Oh, so the other thing is that you have activate right here. Um, if you actually have it not activated to begin with, and we hit play, it's not there. So this would be a thing where we would actually open up your, by selecting it first, open up a level blueprints. And then if I right click, it would bring in that reference to the sound. And then I would say, I don't know, it's either activate or play. Let's see if it has play. Audio component, so let's go ahead and play it. I think I can also have done activate, and then we'll just do it on a key press. So it's not activated, but I want after an event, when I walk through a wall, when I do whatever, I don't have a first person character in here to do a collision with, but um, an event is also a key press. No sound, and then G. Fast remixes. All right. And oh, so there's an option for uh, with these sounds also to say that it's UI sounds. Um, it might not work. Oh, yeah, so is UI sound. This means that it's like soundtrack music. This is where you'd have a stereo or a multi track thing, and that it's just in your ears. It's always the same level no matter where you go. Uh, there's some great rules for the levels you want to mix for a game. Like, what do you want? Um, a special effect, what do you want talking, what do you want uh, uh, soundtrack music to be leveled at within the game, and that's assuming that you're bringing in all your things already pre-leveled at a nice mastering, and it's on the documentation if you want to go in there and you're like, it's not really working, it's like, oh, you should always have uh, gunshots at 0.75, but music should be at 0.85, and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a good thing to think about, but then you obviously take that idea and make it your own. So we also have... Uh, we have reverb zones as well, and hopefully it works a little bit better than my low-pass filter attempt. So in my volumes, I should have a volume of, let's just say an audio volume, and I probably could choose reverb from inside of there. So let's put it over here and resize it. And it's basically the idea is that wherever you enter in this area, Let's say it's behind a wall or it's inside the cave. You, do, you now have a different kind of audio, and it's affected by reverb, which you can make completely with inside uh, the engine. Um, you can also download a bunch of uh, reverb files. Um, by reverb files, I mean files people have already made in Unreal, not like uh, impulse files that are um, used for audio engineering, which is also a thing. Yonk. So with the selected, I can say that I want to have, um, so I can choose a reverb effect, but can I also just make my own? So let's just crank it, see if we can get something to happen. This is being irresponsible. So outside of this volume, it's going to do this stuff, and inside this volume, it's going to do the other stuff. Let's see if this works. 
G. I might actually have to have a character for this. I'm not even playing on it. Let's see if I have a reverb effect. No, I don't have a reverb effect. Create new asset. Reverb effect. New reverb effect. Okay. So, let's change some stuff. And just so you know, I've, I've never actually done this before. So, I'm just make, I'm making this up right now. We're going to add some gain. And delay time. That sounds like the one we want. We just want we just want delay. That's all we want. Let's save that. Decay time. This is all good. I mean, we could do this as a group. All right. So crash. So this, when this crashes, no, I'm joking. I have no advice. You just you panic. Um, you, you have a friend, you know, go restart it for you because you're like wearing some sort of skin tight suit with like reflective balls all over you. You can't be doing everything yourself. So, oh look, I still have a reverb effect. Let's see if it has all that decay that I wanted. Oh, it does. It's an amazing amount of decay. So, we're going to go into the details panel of our volume, of our, uh, sorry, our audio and we're going to say use this reverb Attenuation setting well now where is it so just so you guys know I've never actually done audio before um, I did my entire project with external audio um, but I didn't do it so I'm trying to learn it for you guys. Everyone saw it earlier. Simulation settings. Well, let's move on. You guys get the idea of reverb. I'll owe you like a better demo in a, in a bit. Oh, my bad. Why didn't anyone stop me? Will, what's wrong? It's the it's the volume, not from the sound volume. Sound volume, which got lost. Audio volume, there we go. Audio volume can have a reverb effect. And then I check the down. There's the new one I made. And let's see what happens. I'm going to save the case. G. Yeah. I got a person in here. All right, moving on. So what we can also do though with, with these um, sounds is we just have a kind of a naked sound in here, but we can do a lot more with this. We can right click on this in the same way we create materials out of textures, we can create cues out of sounds. So I right clicked on our sound and I hit create cue. And now you might notice that we now have a very familiar format. This is a blueprint for sound. This is called a cue. And basically, it all goes and it hooks up to an output, which I just double click on. Or I can hit play from over there. There's a lot less you can do with sound um, than you can do with other items in Unreal, which is why I was saying people use FMOD. They can do a lot of essential things. Like, I can choose, um, and here's your palette on the right side, and these are all the things you can do in here. We can mix multiple sounds together so they happen at the same time. We can choose a random sound so that every time you hit it, it chooses a different sound. Or we can modulate so that every time I choose the same sound, if I select on here on the left side, it says there's a minimum and a maximum for pitch and volume. So I can say 0.5 and 1.5 that every time I hit it, So with, you can see that using mixing sounds, you choosing random sounds, and then modulating all the sounds in a chain can, let's say you put modulator last, you have a couple of sounds that you put randomly, you're randomly choosing them, they go to a modulator last. You can make 
12 sounds sound like 100 sounds. But I'm going to move on fairly quickly, and I don't really think I'm going to get it all done. Doppler. Uh, Doppler's in here. Okay. So um, it's basically going to just be an intensity, and as you move through it, as you go by it, it will have the effect. So I'm going to go in here and delete the sound. And Doppler effect is about the compression of rare fraction of sound waves. As something comes closer to you, it compresses the waves and makes them much higher. And then as it leaves behind you, it, it elongates all the waves behind it and it makes them a lot lower. And as you, if, as like a comet went by you or a bullet, you go, soo, soo. And that's, a, and that's what a Doppler effect is. It's also some sort of like meteorology, meteorology thing. But meteorology thing. So we're going to delete and put in the Q this time. Let's see if we can whiz by it. Activate it. So all the different settings I did in the other one aren't here for this one, so I have to like make it have an attenuation and make sure that it's auto-activated. And let's see if it works without a character. So it kind of did that. Let's make it looping. Oh, we go into the setting and say, choose the sound and say that it's looping. There we go. Hit play. Better to move the sound than move the person. Um, okay, so with five minutes left, what can I do? In your Slack, you have under code examples two precompiled um, plugins: one for Mac and one for Windows for Open Sound Control. Open Sound Control we might mention earlier. It's a way of sending data, uh, streams of data, in packets between different um, applications. Um, it's very similar to like how you guys use Serial and Arduino. This is just um, a different format that's a, that's um, easier to use. Um, by having Open Sound Control in Unreal, you can um, connect it to the whole world around you. So I'm going to take this project and save it, and I'm going to close it, and then I'm going to go find it. And so I find my project, which is week seven. And here in this root folder, I'm going to make a folder for plugins. Plugins. And then I'm going to go to Slack and I am going to download for Mac. And um, so this is pre compiled for 4.8, which is the version we're using in class. Um, if you ever want to learn how to compile plugins, I'll show you how for when um, Unreal progresses in the future and there's future versions you want to use. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just show you how you quickly use a different interface to turn on and off sound or lights. Show and Finder. So I'm just going to unzip. And then back in that Unreal project. Week 7, and then plug in, I'm going to throw it in there. And then I'm going to reopen the project. And then what you'll see is that when we go to the plugins window, OSC will be enabled, and we'll have a whole new set of functions that's about receiving and sending out um, data in either bools, floats, integers, or strings. So under my plugins, I now have at the bottom, OSC is enabled and it's installed. So very quickly, if you guys will bear with me, I'm going to do a blueprint for an actor. I'm just going to put a light in there. 
Then I'm going to turn the light off and on from a different so piece of software. I said audio. And I'm going to switch the light. All right, so the point light, it's on. It's great. And we're going to have another object in here in our components, and we can add an OSC component. Right there, OSC receiver. OSC is an event. So just like we did with uh, overlaps, we're going to go over here, and we're going to say on OSC receive, we're going to create this event. It's going to create an event. And OSC, you might have heard um, Alejandro say it, you send things via URL, URL streams. You can divide different bits of data by different forward slash and some text breaks. So we're going to say an address. We're going to say forward slash light. Uh, we're going to say the addresses we're going to hit equals so that we have a name. That we're going to give forward slash light. This is the address we're going to be receiving OSC from. The data can come off. It's a, this is a, an array of data. Um, it just knows it's going to be one. It doesn't have any data just yet. And we're going to pop the data off. Um, this is kind of like you pop the top off. Um, I'll show you, and I'll do a tutorial later on this weekend, and I'll send it to you, where I'm going to send you a bunch of different things, and you're going to see how you can take off a stack of data and get a bunch of different frequencies and stuff from, from music. Today we're just going to get a bool, which is an a, a on-off, 0 or 1. And then we're going to add in a little bit of logic. We're going to use an object called branch, which is our best friend for using OSC. And what it basically says is that it has a condition that is either true or false. And that condition is that if we get data on that address, then let's toggle this light's visibility. We're going to say true. I can also say if it is on light and it is a bool, if I want to be a little more specific, I could say these two together are, when these two together are true, I want you to toggle on and off. So we're going to compile and throw this into the scene. We have a light that's on. Over there. Bring him up. There he is. And I'm going to switch over to a program uh, called Max really quickly. And I'm going to do very little in it. I'm just going to use uh, a few objects. So it's one of those pr great programs that opens up with a blank slate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a 0 or 1 by putting a toggle in there. And then I'm going to send it on a message for light. Um, variables and max are dollar signs. And then I'm going to send it on UDP. I'm going to say that it's on my local host, it's on my own computer, and that I know that this software defaults, uh, um, that Unreal's plugin defaults to being on a port. And I'm just going to quickly get this up and running. And I'll give you a better example at home. So that when I hit this, I can turn the light off and on. In the same way as serial and stuff like that. So here, hit play. And the light is on. Wow. What the hell is happening? So, oh my goodness, two seconds guys, there we go, now we're unreal. Now I'm turning it off and on. This could be any number, this could be any frequency or whatever. I will um, show you guys how to deal a little bit more with this because this is an extremely powerful uh, tool to affecting, letting other participants affect your world inside your um, game. So go have fun at TNL.